Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for attending this talk. This evening, uh, I will try to argue the following. I'm going to argue that the present financial crisis is uh, far from over. This crisis is generally uh, misunderstood, is generally misrepresented, and the present policies are largely misdirected and counterproductive. They're not making things better, they will ultimately make the crisis worse. This is not a crisis of capitalism. In fact, it has very little to do with capitalism. Uh, this is a crisis of our fiat money system, of a paper money system, a monetary system in which money is constantly being expanded under the discretion of central banks. In fact, I would argue that such a crisis was sooner or later inevitable in a paper money system, a system of elastic money and constant monetary creation. You know, such a system must, over time, create imbalances that make a crisis like the one we are in inevitable. In fact, I argue that the present crisis will probably mark the end game for this latest experiment with state paper money. One of the reasons I, I wrote this book was that in sort of my many years in financial markets, I found it amazing that although over time the dislocations and problems with the financial system became ever more evident and uh, ever clearer to see for everybody, that at no stage I felt anybody really questioned that the basis for these problems could be the fact that we have a system of, uh, as I said, elastic fiat money, of constant monetary expansion. And I was particularly surprised because this was an approach that I think previous generations of economists uh, you know, had readily understood. If you only go back two or three generations of economists, I think most of what I say this evening here uh, would probably be readily understood and accepted by people. And in fact, I think most of these economists would shake their heads in disbelief if they had a chance to look at our current monetary system. So I don't think that what I'm saying here or what I wrote in my book is, uh, I don't claim that this is completely new. I, uh, in fact, many of what uh, I base my, my book on is, is based on the work by Ludwig von Mises and other economists. Um, uh, and I think, I think it wasn't just the Austrian school, I think other economists as well would have readily understood uh, what the fundamental problems of our monetary system are. Uh, in order to understand these problems and our present crisis, I think we have to go back to some of the fundamentals of this monetary system. We have to look at it on a conceptual level. And that is why the first part of my book, and I think really the, the, the larger part of my book, does not deal specifically with current events or you know, current developments or recent policy initiatives, but deals with some fundamental you know, conceptual questions about our monetary system. And that's what I'd like to do here to do first. We then come to the present crisis, apply the conceptual analysis to the present crisis, and can make predictions on that basis. So allow me first to make a couple of conceptual observations on our monetary system. And first I need to define a couple of terms that I've already used. I used paper money, I used fiat money, I used elastic money. Now for me these terms uh, mean the same. I think they are synonymous, I use them synonymously in this book and also in my talk tonight. The title of my book is Paper Money and I picked that term because I think that is the term we traditionally use to denote a monetary system that is not commodity money. So th these are the two conceptual alternatives that we have when we look at monetary systems, commodity money and paper money. Now it's very clear that the historical norm has been commodity money. People have been using money for about two and a half thousand years and for all these years money has been a commodity. You know, commodity money has been historically the normal case. I would even argue that commodity money is the traditional free market money because whenever and wherever people were free to choose where the trading public had to find a medium of exchange to facilitate transaction on markets, they always picked a commodity. And in all societies and all cultures throughout the world, they ended up picking precious metals. You know, gold and silver have for thousands of years been monetary assets around the world. And there are very good reasons for it. I mean, I will I will now speak mainly about gold, and I learned over recent months that uh, silver has a huge fan base, and whenever I speak about gold, people start complaining that I leave out silver. 
uh, I think gold has a huge advantage over silver, but you know, silver is also a very powerful monetary asset. But I don't want to say gold and silver all evening, so I will speak about gold. <laughs> of all the 92 natural occurring elements in the universe, you know, gold is uniquely positioned to be a monetary <laughs> asset. It is indestructible, it doesn't decay, it's perfectly divisible, it's homogeneous and fairly easily accessible, uh, and importantly, its supply is pretty inelastic. Gold can be mined, so can silver, it takes time, it involves expenses, uh, so at least over the short term, the supply of this form of money is essentially inelastic. So whenever the public was free to choose a medium of exchange, they picked an inelastic commodity. So it's clear that in a commodity money economy, there is nobody who can quickly inject additional money into the economy or who can make sure that over uh, time the supply of money to the economy expands at a predetermined pace. Money in a commodity money world is largely you know, inelastic. And there are two other aspects that I'd like to stress. One is that this form of money is obviously outside of political control. And I'm sure that over hundreds and thousands of years, the trading public wanted to pick a medium of exchange that was outside the control of politics, of you know, kings and you know, whoever was in charge. It's an apolitical form of money, although the state got involved in you know, minting it, uh, uh, mining it, and, and uh, you know, putting its insignia on it. Um, it, it, the state could not control the supply of commodity money. And closely linked to this factor is the point that this form of money has always been international money. Because if gold was a medium of exchange on this side of the border, it was e uh, equally uh, gold on the other side of the border, regardless of whose face was printed on the coin. In fact, in the 18th century, the most commonly used medium of exchange in the British colonies in North America were not British coins, but were uh, uh, Spanish silver coins. Now, obviously, we use money to facilitate human uh, uh, cooperation on markets, to facilitate trade and exchange, and trade and exchange does not stop at borders, it never did, and so this form of money was you know, equally you know, crossing uh, borders and facilitating international trade. So commodity money is really, I would say, the capitalist form of money. It was freely chosen by the public, it's inelastic, it's not under political control, and it's international. That's commodity money. Now we talk about paper money. Well, paper money is obviously elastic money. Paper money can be printed. Printing money is essentially costless, and in today's world, where we have largely electronic money, it's definitely costless. So uh, the supply of money can be constantly expanded. But in the paper money system, not everybody is allowed to print money. Yeah. Paper money systems are always state paper money systems. You know, the, the state has the monopoly on money creation. Uh, it's part of the territorial monopoly of the state. Uh, and the, the, the state determines who can also create money within its jurisdiction and how much. So this is definitely political money. And it's being issued and the, its issuance is being directed for political reasons and, and political, for political purposes. In fact, it's interesting to note that Never in human history has a complete paper money system come about simply through market forces. There's no point at which the trading public demanded you know, inelastic commodity money to be replaced with some you know, constantly expanding elastic paper money because they deemed this to be more efficient or more helpful for their transactions. Paper money systems are always, by definition, state paper money systems. Uh, I know many of you will be aware that obviously through gold standard times, banks issued banknotes, some of which were backed by gold, some of which were not backed by gold. But again, these are not uh, paper money systems, because even in these economies, money was ultimately gold. And these bankers had to promise ultimately redemption in gold. Whether they could meet these promises or not is a different point. But the public did not cease to use gold and demanded at certain times your payment in money proper, which was gold. A pure paper money system is one in which money is irredeemable. Where mo money is an irredeemable piece of paper that the central bank does not redeem into, into a commodity. Those systems are always state paper money systems. Also, they are no national, they are not international. Now, if I cross a border from one country into another, I will have to exchange my paper money for a new paper money, because in the new jurisdiction, there will be another government that will issue money uh, as well. Um, so it's very clear that if we speak about the money of the free market, 
we would easily have to say that this is gold or silver and certainly not paper money systems. Now, interestingly, today, we again live in a paper money system. Um, and our, today's model is, is in many ways very special. It's, first of all, it's not very old. Uh, I mean, the, the present monetary arrangements have only really come into full force on the 15th of August 1971. So it's been exactly 40 years that we had an unrestricted paper money system. Uh, it is not that prior to that date we had a gold standard, far from it. Uh, we had the, uh, the Bretton Woods system. But um, remember, after the Second World War, central banks around the world started to use the US dollar as a, uh, as a reserve currency. And the US government had extended a promise to all those central banks around the world that they could exchange their dollar reserves uh, for physical gold with the US Treasury at a fixed price. And although the link to gold was therefore more tenuous than in a proper gold standard, this indeed functioned as a restraint on US dollar money production. And this restraint was obviously uh, lifted by Richard Nixon on the 15th of August 1971. And since that date, for the last 40 years, the world, the entire world, is for the first time ever on a complete paper standard. You know, it's the, for the first time that the entire world uses unrestricted paper money. And uh, we know all around the world, you know, there are hundreds of central banks with, uh, who have the right uh, within their, the territorial monopoly of the state to print money and essentially print money without limit and at no cost. <clears throat> So the first question is now, uh, uh, obviously, is this system, why do we have the system? Why, why, why did we go away from the gold system and go to this system? I mean, I think the disadvantages of the system, uh, some of them are already clear from the definition I just gave. You know, the first one is we are now subject to political control uh, in our monetary affairs. But the other point I mentioned is the segregation, the monetary segregation of global markets. Um, that introduces an element of uh, barter partial barter into our economic relationships. You know, when I receive an income in the UK and I want to spend some of that income in the United States, I cannot take my UK money balances over to the United States and spend them there because the United States has a different your paper money system. So I have to find somebody in the market who can do the opposite transaction of the one I'm trying to do, who's buying my ster pound sterling and who's selling me US dollars. That introduces an element of partial barter into international trade. And the way you know, markets have tried to cope with that is by developing a now very efficient you know, two or three trillion dollar a day, 24 hours a day uh, foreign exchange market. What's interesting to me is that this market is now deemed to be almost the epitome of modern capitalism and free market, when in fact it's a, it's a makeshift. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a second best solution that people came up with because they had to uh, uh, facilitate international trade in a world in which you know, each country wants to have its own money and print its own money for very national reasons. Um, so, so clearly, for international global capitalism, the, the, the present paper money system has disadvantages. Now, I think that some of the, the, the risks and problems with paper money uh, are today understood and readily accepted even by the, uh, the, um, you know, the defenders, uh, the, the mainstream, but you know, who defends the system. And that is obviously the problem of you know, higher inflation. Uh, because in this system, obviously, the state can constantly print money, and that can ultimately lead to a decline in purchasing power. But I will argue that you know, there are much more fundamental problems outside of the price level you know, with a system of elastic money. But before I come to those points, it's very interesting to note there's another thing that should, right from the start, concern us about current monetary arrangements, which is the fact that this is obviously not the first time we have a paper money system. They have been tried before. In fact, paper money systems have been tried for about 900 years uh, in various countries, various cultures. Uh, the first ones date back to uh, you know, the Chinese dynasties of the, of the 11th century. The Chinese invented paper, ink, and printing, and so they were the first to experiment with paper money. Uh, and it's very interesting to note that all these, uh, these experiments ended in failure. Uh, not only the Chinese experiments, but also the ones that were later started in the West. The first one in, in the Western world is probably the one in Massachusetts from 1690, when Massachusetts was still a British colony and uh, issued paper money to fund military excursions into Quebec. 
Uh, then we had paper money systems, obviously, in France under the John Law scheme from 1716 to 1720. Then again in America, the Continentals, uh, issued by the Continental Congress in 1775. Uh, we had uh, uh, paper money during the Civil War in the United States, the so-called greenbacks from 1861 to 1879. Uh, Britain had paper money essentially from um, uh, 1797 to 1821. Various experiments in paper money. All of these uh, uh, were uh, implemented for one very clear reason, to fund the government. In, in each of the cases I just mentioned, there was either a war or a revolution uh, and the, the government needed money. Uh, there was the same in China, it was the same in, in, in all the Western examples I gave. Um, uh, when the state needed expenses, it, it ex uh, needed funding, it issued its own paper currency. Uh, and it, it, previous generations of politicians didn't even make any pretenses about this. This was you know, readily accepted that the state would fund itself by issuing you know, paper money. Uh, another, I, I mentioned that all these paper money schemes ended in failure. Uh, none of them survived, but they always ended in one of two ways. You know, either monetary authorities realized that the constant issuance of money would lead to problems, higher prices, inflation, and other economic dislocations, and they stopped issuing paper money voluntarily. You know, that was the case, for example, in China with the Ming Dynasty, which stopped issuing paper money in the 15th century, and interestingly, China although it invented paper money, did not use paper money for almost 500 years. Uh, another example would be uh, Britain, which you know, went off a, a gold standard practically in 1797 to fund the war with France, and went back onto a gold standard in 1821. The United States had left the gold standard uh, to fund the Civil War, as I said, in 1861, and they went back voluntarily to gold in 1879. So one way of, uh, uh, for these, you know, paper money episodes to end is the voluntary, voluntary return uh, to commodity money. And the, the other outcome is simply that that is not being achieved in time. More and more money is being printed. The public loses confidence in paper money, and this leads to hyperinflation and currency collapse. And the other, these examples are French assignons in 1803 or German Reichsmark in 1920 through, uh, 1923, uh, the first three Chinese dynasties. Which, uh, which all issued paper money and saw hyperinflation and currency collapse. So the history is, 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 not, is not very encouraging here. You know, paper money systems have ultimately led either to return to commodity money. They are always led to high inflation and economic instability. And either they led to a voluntary return to commodity money or to complete currency disaster. So looking at these, at these problems that we already identified and the, and the very bleak you know, historical record, is, it is amazing and I think it, it needs to be explained you know, why again you know, we have arrived at a complete paper money system you know, and why it is so readily accepted and, and why today's consensus, the mainstream, mainstream economists, politicians and even the general public uh, considers this to be a natural system, it even describes the system as capitalist and there is some assumption, I think, almost, that this system is, must be the natural outcome of market forces, that a modern industrialized economy uh, you know, needs, uh, needs that form of money. And, and for most people, I think any kind of like a gold standard, any idea that money would be an inflexible commodity uh, seems almost atavistic, you know, that, that's almost outdated, that's something that people did in the past. Um, and uh, t t so today, I, I think this general acceptance of our somewhat strange monetary arrangements uh, need some explaining. Now, I think, I think there are three key points, I would say, that today uh, are most common in raising support for, for our paper money system. Now, one is, I think, that generally people believe that an expanding economy also needs an expanding supply of money. And the idea sort of is natural for a growing economy where more transactions occur every year, uh, that somehow we need a larger supply of money to facilitate these transactions. So somebody, an economy needs a money producer. Somebody will make sure that the supply of money expands with the economy and therefore allows the economy to expand. Now it's very clear from the start that we should be a bit suspect, suspicious of this, uh, this, this, this point simply because most of human you know, uh, civilization evolved 
on hard commodity money. I mean, the Industrial Revolution occurred on a gold standard. Um, and, and so it doesn't, it's not quite a convincing argument. But if you look closer, we can see also on a conceptual level, there's no basis for this argument whatsoever, simply for the reason that money is very different from any other good or service. You know, money, money is, is um, as a medium of exchange, you only hold money for its exchange value and not for any use value. So what that means is that is in the very nature of a medium of exchange that any physical quantity of it can facilitate any number of transactions and can meet any amount of money demand because we can adjust the purchasing power of money so that money facilitates a larger number of transactions or bigger transactions and also meets a larger money demand. And in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an economy that constantly exchanges goods and services for money, this happens naturally. You know, if, if the majority of people have a rising demand for money, that means they sell goods and services or reduce their money spending on goods and services. And therefore, prices have a tendency to decline, the purchasing power of money goes up, and the same physical money balances that people hold will now buy more goods, they represent more purchasing power, and this is what you really demand when you demand money. When somebody has demand for money, nobody has demand for a certain number of banknotes or a certain weight in gold. You, know, you have demand for purchasing power. And the reason you hold money is because you want to have some of your wealth in most readily tradable form, in its most readily exchangeable form. That's money. And that is the reason why, you know, for centuries, you know, a, a growing economy and developing economy could function simply on the basis of um, you know, fairly uh, inelastic supply of money. The same obviously works the other way around. If the de demand for money should decline for whatever reason, people start spending money and that means prices rise and at the higher uh, uh, price level or the lower purchasing power of each monetary unit, people will hold more of, of the monetary asset to just to keep the same kind of purchasing power that they had before. Um, so, so this is a quite natural process that, that, that perfectly explains uh, you know, why a grow, even a growing economy does not a grow, need a growing supply of money. And I, I think closely linked to this is because I think at this point many mainstream economists will argue, well, this must mean that the purchasing power of money or the price level is hugely volatile in a commodity money system. Because if demand for money fluctuates but nobody adjusts the supply of money, that means we must constantly have moves in the price level and the purchasing power of money. Now, this is also not the case, and for the simple reason that if you go back to my previous example, and if you look at uh, in an economy um, in which the majority of people suddenly have a higher demand of mon for money, they want to hold more of their wealth in, in, in readily exercisable form, in the form of money, uh, you know, these people uh, will then uh, uh, sell goods and services, try to accumulate higher money balances. That puts a downward pressure on prices, an upward pressure on the purchasing power of the monetary unit. But the other people in the economy will experience no change in their money demand, who are very happy with the money balances that they're, they're holding presently, suddenly realize that their money balances are buying more goods and services now than before. But these people do not want to hold more of their purchasing power in the form of money. In fact, sort of the opportunity cost of holding some of your wealth in, in the form of money is rising for these people, so they will readily spend the money. And you see that this is, is, is a very dynamic process that will tend to offset some of the demand shifts somewhere else in the economy. I'm not arguing here that commodity money will be you know, perfectly stable in its purchasing power. In fact, you know, a perfectly stable purchasing power cannot and can never be realized and is, is, is a complete fantasy. Uh, but what I argue is that uh, we can explain conceptually why uh, an inelastic form of money can accommodate changes in money demand without massive fluctuations in the purchasing power of money. And empirically, this is very clearly seen in all historical data because inflations and deflations were largely unknown to commodity money systems. Commodity money systems should in fact have a minor tendency to deflate and uh, conceptually I think that, is, that, is, that can clearly be shown but even that is empirically very, very difficult to see. It's, it's, it's a minor secular deflation. But uh, big swings and uh, swings in the purchasing power of money that disrupt the economy were largely unknown to commodity money worlds. In, 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 it's true that economists only really began to study 
inflation as an economic phenomenon uh, in the early 19th century after the Bank of England had gone off gold, um, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, William Pitt used, used the bank to, to fund the war. Um, so so the, these generally accepted points, we need more money for a growing economy. I think that, that does not uh, stand up to any scrutiny, and neither does the point that, that our paper money system will give us um, a, a more stable purchasing power. The opposite is obviously true. I mean, historically, since 1971, the decline in the purchasing power of the dollar and the decline in the purchasing power of the pound sterling have been the most extreme in their two to three hundred year history. So if you look for swings in the purchasing power of the monetary unit, you will only ever find them in paper money systems. Even at times of uh, coin debasement in Roman times, or even at times of large gold discoveries in the 15th century in, uh, in America, uh, and a large inflow of gold into, into Western Europe, uh, even these events, um, uh, judging by historical data, were minor inflations compared to anything under a pure paper standard. So, you know, stability of purchasing power would argue for a commodity standard, and there is no need in a growing economy to have a growing supply of money. So, uh, again, it leaves us with the question, so why, why do we have our present system, and why it is so um, uh, defended, and why is it so readily accepted by people? And I think the key reason for me is that today our paper money system is very closely linked to the banking system and the expansion of bank credit. And I think the, the, the key reason why uh, the system is generally considered uh, superior is because it allows the constant expansion of bank credit. Uh, and, and therefore, is, there's a general belief today that by encouraging this expansion of bank credit and therefore lowering interest rates on markets and encouraging extra investment we can generate prosperity and higher growth rates. Uh, and this is, in a way, a fairly new idea. And I think it, we have to understand that uh, in our present monetary system, um, the, the, the state has now played a, a crucial role in supporting uh, the banking sector. So we need to have a quick look at banks now, because this, I think, is, the, is, a, is a different phenomenon to some of the older monetary systems. Um, it is clear that banks are also money producers. And this is something that was even the case under gold standard conditions. Um, how do banks do this? Now, obviously, since the start of banking, banks have engaged in what we call fractional reserve banking, which means banks uh, have managed to issue money substitutes. And today we can best think of them as bank notes or uh, deposits at banks. Um, and these uh, money substitutes, or we often call them fiduciary media, um, were used by the public just as if they were money proper, as if they were gold. And the reason for that is simply that the banks promised that they could be redeemed at any moment uh, for gold, uh, although the banks only kept a fraction of these deposits or these banknotes in physical gold in their vaults. That's why fractional reserve banking. So to, to the extent that banks managed to issue fiduciary media and have the public accept them uh, as uh, like they were gold, like they were money proper, the banks could, in fact, to some degree become money producers. They could fund some of their credit expansion, some of their loan business, uh, not by simply taking money from customers and lending it on, but by expanding credit, by issuing extra fiduciary media. Uh, this is something that banks have been doing for a long time, and is obviously the reason why the history of banking is also the history of bank runs and occasional panics, because it is clear that when the public, for whatever reason, loses trust and faith in the banks, they want their money back, and then the banks can't pay, and immediately a bank run you know, sets in. Now, it's, it's very clear that from early days that you know, this type of banking, when this type of banking grew, that very early on, economists got interested in it and looked at it, not only from the perspective of the individual bank, but also what it meant for the larger economy. And, and here again, it's very clear to see that you know, this, this process on the face of it looks um, um, advantageous, advantageous because uh, you know, the, the banks lower interest rates, uh, expand their balance sheets, create extra fiduciary media, create money, therefore extend their credit business. Uh, extra investment can occur, interest rates are lower, extra investment is being encouraged, and that should be good for the economy. 
But what economists found out you know, early on in the, in the 19th century here in Britain, I mean, David Ricardo is one example, and what was later then um, even developed into a proper, you know, full-fledged business cycle theory by Ludwig von Mises in the early 20th century, what these economists found out is that there's a huge difference whether credit creation and investment is funded by savings or is funded by extra issues of fiduciary media or extra money creation. Uh, the difference in a nutshell is that if you expand investment and credit on the basis of saving, you do get sustainable growth and rising prosperity. If you fund your investment and your credit on, on, on printed money, you get a boom-bust cycle. You get a short period of boom followed by a bust. And this is today, I mean, this used to be called the monetary theory of the business cycle, although because of Ludwig von Mises' uh, superior explanation of it, it's now often called the Austrian theory of the business cycle. And in a way, the best way for me to look at it is uh, you have to understand that in a market economy, one of the important decisions to be made by uh, those who participate in the economy is how many resources that are available to us now should be directed towards meeting present consumption needs and how many resources can be shifted into uh, different users, make them investments, and therefore develop a, 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 a productive capital, a capital stock, raise productivity, and produce for the future. So it's that split between consumption, saving, and investment that, is, is that every economy uh, needs to make these decisions. And to coordinate these decisions across the economy, uh, interest rates play a crucial role. Now what happens in, uh, when banks issue extra fiduciary media, when they become money producers, and lower interest rates on loan markets and, and issue extra credit and encourage extra investment, investment pro projects are being started that are not based in savings. So not, the consumers have not made a voluntary decision to refrain from consumption, make resources available to be redirected to become productive capital and allow the capital stock to expand and, and therefore support investment. In a way, you can almost think of the, uh, the, the um, entrepreneurs getting the funds to start investment projects without the, the, the um, real resources, including labor, being made available to them through a savings decision by the consumer at the same time. These resources are still required by the consumer you know, near to consumption. The, 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 the consumer has not released these resources and made them available for future directed investment projects for the entrepreneurs. So interest rates are crucial in, all, uh, in coordinating this process between saving and investing. This process get, gets systematically disrupted if you inject money into the, into the markets, artificially lower interest rates. You can create a boom for a while, but sooner or later it becomes clear that nobody has made these resources available. Investment projects can't be seen through to their end. They need to collapse, and then you get the recession and the bust. And what the Austrians had to say uh, um, you know, once the recession started was something that most people didn't want to hear, which was that, you know, once you had the credit boom, the artificial credit boom, and it had turned into a bust, there was not much that policy could do because you had misallocated resources in the artificial boom. And the only way to get these resources back into line with, you know, the preferences of the consumer was to allow a cleansing recession, to allow these <coughs> you know, unsustainable investment projects to be liquidated by the market and the market move again to some sort of balance. So if you want to avoid a recession, if you, if you do not like a business cycle, what you should do is you should make sure that money doesn't get too elastic. You should maybe make sure that banks do not engage in fractional reserve banking or do not extend credit, you know, too readily. Um, as I said, you know, these ideas already originated in, in Britain in the, in the mid-19th century and they had some impact on policy uh, with, the, with the Peel Act in 1844, which stopped banks from issuing banknotes, uh, although that had some other uh, unfortunate side effects as well. But uh, when Ludwig von Mises uh, even developed this theory further into the Austrian business cycle theory in the early 20th century, in fact, he had no impact on policy. Because what we clearly can see, if you look back in the 20th century, the opposite, policy did the opposite of what the Austrians or the British classical economists would have recommended. Because for the last 100 years, we've been making money more elastic. Because it's very clear that politicians like this idea of a credit boom. The idea that banks expand credit, that they can create money and expand their credit business on the basis of money creation, was something that was you know, politically 
um, you liked. Politicians wanted the, the credit boom. They just didn't want the bust. So the first idea was to provide some kind of backstop. You know, whenever the boom turned into a bust and the bank runs occurred and people were concerned about the overextended banks, uh, there should be some backstop from the government. And that was the, uh, the idea of, of uh, you know, our modern central banks. And um, it's very interesting that this was even started at times of the gold standard. I mean, the US Federal Reserve was founded in 1913 when America was still on the gold standard. Uh, and the idea was to provide, as the name says, a federal reserve, you know, some, somewhere a government institution that would backstop the banks if they had extended and if the credit, when the credit boom turns into a bust. Now, it's also clear that what this meant is now that with the, with the, um, um, with the, government, with the help of government backing, the banks were now encouraged to extend the credit boom even further. You know, the banks were now encouraged to lower their reserve ratios even more and you know, uh, therefore extend credit further and print more money and issue more fiduciary media. And now we had an even larger credit boom, which according to the Austrian theory and, and the British classical economist, now all, only means that you get a bigger bust at the end of it. And I think, <clears throat> I think also this may be a little bit of an of a, of a, uh, oversimplification. I do think that this is largely the story behind the Great Depression. You know, although the, the, the problems that led to the Great Depression started in the 1920s at a time when America was officially on a gold standard, at the time already, you know, bank credit expansion was hugely supported and subsidized by a government entity, the U.S. Federal Reserve. And the massive credit boom that we had in the 1920s, according to business cycle theory, must lead to the type of dislocations that made a major correction inevitable. Um, now, what did politicians do after this occurred, where they tried to make money even more elastic? Because if now the, the limited supply of gold was a hindrance in supporting the banks to expand further, then gold had to go and had to be replaced with fully elastic uh, you know, fiat money. And I think this is maybe a bit simplified, but this is in essence the history, how we got to our modern banking system and our whole modern monetary arrangement. So the idea here is that we can have credit booms, we can have investment booms that are based on printed money, on low interest rates, where low interest rates do not result from accumulated savings, from voluntary decisions by consumers to shift resources from consumption to investment, but where uh, investment booms are funded by money creation and by uh, encouraging banks to lower their reserve race ratios, issue more money, and therefore have a long-lasting credit boom. I think the, 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 the wish behind the current monetary arrangement is simply to have a never-ending credit boom. Because whenever the cycle now turns, as it must, according to you know, Austrian theory, uh, the dislocations, the mismatch between savings and investment still occurs. You know, even in this system now, now the, your banks can expand their balance sheets more and print more money and lend more credit, it still leads to a mismatch between investment activity and true voluntary savings of the consumer. So these mismatches and imbalances will still accumulate in the economy. But now the idea is, when the economy rolls over, the central bank can lower interest rates, can print extra bank reserves. Bank reserves are no longer gold, as they used to be in America until 1933. They're now just bank reserves that the Federal Reserve can create out of thin air. You know, there's no limit to how many bank reserves the Fed can produce. So whenever the economy goes into recession, the central bank prints more money and encourages the system to, uh, to, to, uh, to grow even further. So uh, now what we have is we have replaced the short and somewhat brutal business cycle of the gold standard era plus fractional reserve banking into what I would call the super you know, credit mega cycle. Um, and in a way, I would argue that this cycle must also end at some stage, because now that we, we've done this for the last 40 years in some shape or form, whenever you know, we had a recession, uh, you know, we lowered interest rates, encouraged extra bank lending, and what that meant is that the recession was not allowed to unfold completely, and this was even called managed recessions. You know, for 40 years now we had managed recessions. The recessions were not allowed to cleanse the system of the misallocations of capital. Uh, but um, you know, credit was, uh, interest rates were lowered again, new bank reserves were created, and uh, the, another boom was generated, which meant that now imbalances are being you know, accumulated in the economy and imbalances grow over time.
Now, my point in my book is that this process must have an end game. Because if the Austrians are right, and I think they are, uh, that, that you know, such a process must lead to imbalances and dislocations, at some stage, these must catch up with us. And my argument in my book is that we pretty much reached that point. Now, what would you expect in a system uh, that I just described? I think the first you would accept that the booms get shorter and shallower and the recessions get more persistent and get more difficult to get out of. And that because the imbalances have accumulated to such an extent that policy needs to get ever more aggressive to encourage another credit boom. And this is precisely what we've seen very clearly over the last 10 years. If you look back in 1998, it took the US Fed only a few short interest rate cuts between meetings uh, after the collapse of LTCM and the default of Russia to keep the, the, the credit boom going. After the collapse of the Nasdaq bubble, it took the Fed three years of 1% interest rates to get the economy going back to a pace that the Fed was comfortable with and they started to raise interest rates again. But remember, the, at that stage, the economy was so full of imbalances and so addicted to cheap money and low interest rates that any hikes in interest rates already derailed it again. And in 2007, we had the start of the present crisis. And now, as you all know, for three years, the US Fed is already at zero interest rates and is now conducting quantitative easing. And I do think that what we see right now is, in a way, the logical endgame of the system. In, a, in, a, in the way that the, uh, the imbalances in the economy are so big that the private banks and the private sector is reluctant to expand their own balance sheets ever further uh, because of the recent crises, you, the private sector is reluctant to take on that extra risk and is lacking quite readily the capital to do so and that now the central bank must take on these assets directly. And again, it's a phenomenon that we see around the world is not just uh, confined to the, to the United States. Obviously, the Bank of England is already on a second round of quantitative easing. The ECB has roughly tripled their balance sheet since the start of the crisis and is now under intense pressure to uh, conduct unlimited bond buying programs. Uh, the Japanese central bank is so far uh, a, a rather, rather modest quantitative easer. They are the first who uh, conducted it 10 years ago, but uh, by the standard of the Bank of England today, you know, they've, they've done fairly little. Uh, the, the Fed has roughly uh, tripled its balance sheet since the start of the crisis. In fact, Ben Bernanke has produced uh, you know, more uh, bank reserves and expanded the monetary base more than all his predecessors since 1913 put together. Uh, at the time when Lehman defaulted, uh, bank, the monetary base in the U.S. was about $800 billion. Right now it's $2.6 trillion. Uh, and again, as we all know, the pressure is on to continue to do this. Um, maybe there's another point I'd like to stress. Uh, there's a chapter in my book about this where I, I would argue, I, 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 I try to explain you know, why the system, despite its obvious faults, is so readily accepted by the mainstream today and, and by, the, by the consensus, by the policy consensus. And another reason for this is also the fact that um, I think the focus of economic discourse and the, economic, the focus of economic research has shifted over the last 50 and 60 years. What has happened is that the problems I described uh, with a constantly expanding monetary system are linked very much to factors like relative prices, to capital allocation, capital misallocations. And these are all factors in the economy that have almost slipped off the radar of economic research because over the last 70 years, economic debate has focused much more on the large holes, the, you know, the large aggregates of national account statistics. We speak about consumption and investment and saving as like these large entities. And there is very little perception now of uh, the effects that money ex injections have on relative prices on, and on the allocation of capital. To maybe uh, support this point, let me just read out a quick quote from Ben Bernanke who uh, is, is a famous statement he made in a speech in Washington in 2002. This was when he was already on the board of the Fed, but not yet uh, the chairman. He said the following, the US government has a technology called a printing press, or today is electronic equivalent, that allows it to produce as many US dollars as it wishes at essentially no cost. We conclude that under a paper money system, a determined government can always generate higher spending and hence positive inflation. Now, 
he did say make the statement when he spoke about uh, you know the risk of uh, the U.S. suffering from deflation. So we, we should put it in that context. But I think in a way, in that one statement, he has almost summed up all the points I tried to make tonight. Although you know he considers them all positives, while I consider them negatives. You know he says clearly the U.S. can print as much money as they like. As I explained, there is no limit to how much uh, you know money can be created. Um, uh, interestingly, he says the Fed can print as much money as they like, and he did, does not mention money demand. You know, and as I said before, you know, if once you're the money producer, you can print as much money as you like, because the public will <laughs> simply hold the extra money at a lower purchasing power. If prices rise and the purchasing power money drops, the extra monetary units that are in circulation will be held by the public. So he, he's right in a statement. You know, the U.S. Fed can print as much money. They never run the risk of having unsold units of money in their warehouses. It will be distributed and it will be accepted by the public. Um, but interestingly, his last statement where he says, we conclude that under a paper money system, a determined government can always create higher spending and positive inflation. And I think this is the crucial misunderstanding of the mainstream today because he, he perceives the effect of money creation to be higher spending, higher GDP, and positive inflation. So he, again, the typical modern macroeconomist, he looks at it from the point of view of macro aggregates. You know, it boosts growth and it rises inflation. What he does not perceive at all, I think, and what has, uh, as I said, slipped off the radar screen of modern macroeconomic debate are the, the changes in relative prices that any money injection must induce and therefore the misallocations of capitals. And those have accumulated now for decades, and I think we have now reached that point where the system cannot be pushed out any further. So roughly, be, you need to come to the end of my talk, but to give you the, the quick outlook, uh, which is clear for my title, I think, like all previous paper money systems, this system must also end. Yeah, and again, we face the same choice that all previous paper money system users faced which is either you stop voluntarily printing money, allow the market to liquidate the dislocations, and then go back to some system of stable money. Or you keep printing money and you uh, uh, ultimately debase it to a degree where the public doesn't accept it anymore. And again, allow me just one final quote, and this is from Ludwig von Mises, and it contrasts quite nicely with a quote from Bernanke. Uh, Ludwig von Mises wrote in 1949, there's no means of avoiding the final collapse of a boom brought about by credit expansion. The alternative is only whether the crisis should come sooner as the result of a voluntary abandonment of further credit expansion or later as a final and total catastrophe of the currency system involved. And I, my, my outlook is that we have now reached a point where the dislocations over the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years of constant money expansions are so big, dislocations in the form of overextended and weak banks, um, uh, excessive levels of debt, now largely public sector debt around the world, and distorted asset markets, where these dislocations are so big uh, that I believe it is deemed politically uh, unacceptable to allow the market to liquidate these dislocations. And therefore, I think, unfortunately, people will opt, or politicians and monetary authorities will opt for the second solution that Mises offers, which is continue printing money and ultimately go for money collapse. Thank you very much.